recently that you wrote the script in a very short period of time um, during the pandemic. Could you talk about the just how long you've been working on this, how long the writing process was? Uh, well, uh, uh, thank you, and thanks everybody for coming tonight. We appreciate it. Um, the, um, I guess the, the, the writing process was, was about um, eight weeks and 50 years. <laughs> and, uh, I wanted to write something about Belfast for a long time and made many notes over, over many decades. And then the, the introspection and the silence at the beginning of this lockdown uh, sent me back to another lockdown, which was the one that we experienced at that time. Um, and uh, it was one of those things that sort of uh, poured out and, um, and then it gathered a momentum of its own. I showed it to my brother and sister, who were the two people who I wanted to um, read it first, as they were the first two people to see the film in its finished form, and really depended on them being happy that we were writing about a version, a version of the events inspired by what our family went through. Uh, and then the momentum into making the film and meeting up with all these amazing people followed thereafter. So I, I read, um, in several of the, the reviews I've read, it refers to this as being semi-autobiographical. I don't know if that's a term that you would use, but... Um, well, I, I just think inevitably at a distance of 50 years and when you deliberately uh, set out to sort of look from a, a, the point of view of uh, a nine-year-old, I think that there will be not necessarily a documentary kind of truth, but you hope there would be an emotional truth. And also there was a desire not to make it merely, um, you know, personal therapy or a sort of, you know, sort of recreation of specific events, but hopefully begin with something that could open itself up to do what we've been thrilled to hear in lots of cases the film has done, which is to open up the individual uh, the audience members to thoughts of their own childhood and, and, and related kind of events. So, so to be not literal um, and be semi-autobiographical uh, maybe allows for that to happen more. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when I heard about the film, I, for some reason, deliberately chose not to read any much about it at all. And when I saw the film, um, I, I went in not knowing what to expect. And when I saw it, I was so surprised by, this is a, a, an approach to you know the, the troubles and the Belfast at that time that I had never seen portrayed on the screen before. And the, the warmth of the family, and that's the center, the core of the family, um, you know, they're living through that sectarian violence and, and all the political context, but it's really a story of this family that is so powerful. Well, it, it certainly that seemed to be the center of it, right? and, 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 the, and both you know Kieran and, and, and Jamie, without talking on their behalf, were aware of, of, of what also the Belfast version of that was often characterized by, which is you know passion and, and, and humor as well, and a very particular Belfast sense of humor. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear from the cast about um, Jamie and Katrina. Maybe you could start talking about how, how you created your relationship um, once you were on set and, and diving into this. Because the, the relationships in this family are so strong and powerful. And you know, there's warmth and humor and um, so many nuances to, to your performances. If you could just talk a bit about how you, when you got involved and how you, how you created that marriage. Um, I was involved before Katrina, so I didn't know when, when I got um, involved in it, I didn't know it was going to be Katrina. Um, I'm going to give Ken a load of credit for, you know, considering and um, understanding and, and hoping that we'd be a good match together based on uh, meeting us. And then it's one of those things where we really just hit it off. Um, Katrina is one of, if not the easiest person I've ever worked with. Um, we were thrust into this uncomfortable, um, the first time we met was a dance rehearsal. And if anything's going to bring two people who can't dance very well <laughs> together, <laughs> it is trying to teach them how to dance. So um, I think we bonded pretty quickly over, over our um, lack of ability. An amazing uh, coordination, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, no, I just think, well, so much of the relationship was on the page. You know, I think when it's written so well like that, 
so much of your work is done. Um, but it was, it was really organic. I mean, I think, you know, we, we had this beautiful day, one of the first days as well, where Ken got um, Judy, Kieran, Jamie and myself in a room and we all just sat around and talked about, you know, Ken was very clever in the questions he was asking us about, you know, our childhoods, our parents, you know, how different things would have gone in, in our lives. And, and I think that that also broke down barriers very quickly and we sort of all bonded from that. And, you know, I think, yeah, it was very instantaneous. I mean, Jamie and I have a weirdly a very similar trajectory, even though we've never really met. And um, I don't know, we just have a lot of things in common, so it's just very easy. The, the, the rehearsal for the dancing, was that for the, uh, the wake sequence, was that? Yeah. That, because that scene is amazing. I mean, when the, I mean, I'd love to hear you talk about that as well, because it almost felt, was that the wake? following the death of... Well, it was many, you, and you may have some experiences yourself, but it was many experiences <coughs> we had, sorry, whoops, of, um, yeah, the, 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 you know, the, the yin and yang, the, the celebratory the lunacy of, uh, but especially after my own father slept in the same room as uh, his father for the five, five days and nights that he was laid out as the, everybody came to see him, and I think by the time that was all over, you really needed to let some steam off, you know? And so singing and dancing were, were, were definitely uh, yeah. key. It's a beautiful scene. Um, Jude, I'd love to hear, you, you talk about how you got into this film, what, how you learned about it, what the audition process was like. Well, I remember initially, I sent her self-tape, just to get her self-tape. <laughs> Once I got a call back, I found out like, who would be writing it and directing it. And I ran about my house for about five minutes. <laughs> 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 just a chance to work with all of these actors is just amazing. And I just like looking at these, it's just amazing. <laughs> directed so many great films with always incredibly strong performances and I'm just curious was your approach here similar to how you worked on other films or did you approach this differently and what you were building on, on set? Well I, I think you try to um, find uh, the way whatever the way is for that particular project for this particular group of actors um, who were very very open so I mean a specific example with this one who was very kind uh, Judy Dench, uh, her eyesight's not terribly good, and uh, we provided her with a copy of the uh, the newspaper that she reads as the character. It's called The People's Friend, and it's a religious journal, but it's mainly full of sort of Mills and Boone's romantic stories about, um, you know, in, in carrying torches for doctors who don't realize their lodger is in love with them, etc. And uh, Kieran, uh, do you remember this? Uh, and, uh, in, in lieu of Judy's failing eyes, uh, read a story from the People's Friend to Judy in rehearsal, sort of across a crowded room. Um, 
And it was a magical moment because it was like a, it was, it was as if we'd instantly shifted into their relationship. Um, and she was listening, though. You read it ever so well. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Did you talk about that? Yeah. Uh, but it's, I think it's got to do with the way that um, Ken very quickly and very astutely brought us all together. Because as uh, Katrina was saying, you know, within an hour of us all meeting each other at career ends in a very wide, long table, uh, we kind of all knew each other's childhood. And therefore, we were open enough to know where we all came from. And therefore, what Ken, I think, was using it for was for us to be open enough to, to use our knowledge of each other's childhood to be able to connect instantly with yeah. the person that we want to be. And for Judy and I, it was great because we had never met. And uh, she, she, was, uh, she was such a, a, a dynamo. She's really, her instinct is extraordinary now. Um, her ability to turn the sixpence. I know Ken knows that they worked together so long. But uh, for us to link into uh, believing that we had already had 50 years of marriage together, the preparation, the very quick and astute preparation that Ken kind of suggested we go for was ultimately hugely useful for what we had to do. The, the other thing I'll say though, uh, which Kieran the others one is that, that, that that's really only possible if that group of actors are generous enough to do that because obviously it's a very vulnerable thing you don't know people and maybe you don't want to tell them things that are quite sort of personal to you and there was a great deal of generosity and I think once you see that that's happening you kind of all hold hands together and, and also acknowledge gosh that that is going to be part of the DNA of this piece so the, well for me it was a big thrill I went home feeling uh, that there was a a big heart, a big communal heart beating, beating in that rehearsal room, and it was because they were ready to, um, you know, generously uh, but un unshowily give of themselves. I mean, whatever you did in that process is fully manifest on the screen because I felt like I was living with that family, and just immediately drawn in, and uh, you know, the film unfolds at a. The, the pacing of the film is interesting. It's not rushed or overly dramatic, but he's, you know, there's a steady build of progression of events of like what's going to happen, how they going to have to move, how it's affecting Buddy. I mean, it's, you know, every little emotional nuance is there on the screen. Oh, I was just sorry I didn't live long enough to attend my own wake. <laughs> it was amazing. There was a horn section. <laughs> there were angels. <laughs> Ken, could you talk a bit about the decision to shoot in black and white, and also to have that initial burst of color at the beginning? Um, Jamie, Dawn, and Katrina Bell both rang me and said, we think we both look even more beautiful in black and white. <laughs> <laughs> we insist. We insist that we both rang. I think that was it, wasn't it? It was your agents to begin with, and then <laughs> the, uh, It was to do with the uh, feeling that uh, you know, that curious thing of black and white, when people use that phrase, it's all there in black and white, as if it's additionally authentic <laughs> to have that, even though it's not how we see the world. Um, for me, it, it has this paradox of being sort of um, uh, forensic. You know, you look, because there's less color to look at, Harris, our, our cinematographer, said, color describes people and black and white lets you feel people. Mm. And somehow this poetic dimension to something that was also producing a very sort of authentic quality, the kind of quality that you might see in a, in a great reportage photograph we were sort of after as well. But um, we also wanted colour to be about the Belfast that is now, uh, and also colour to be about the imagination of, uh, of Buddy as, as the cinemas from this neck of the woods uh, explode uh, in his mind. Uh, but I, I do think all, everybody looks better in black and white, to be honest. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, uh, a wonderful sort of, uh, you know, monochromatic palette that is beautiful. Uh, Jamie often told me it was, it was sunny when he was growing up in Belfast. It was always raining. What about you, Kim? What was the weather like when you were growing up? Always raining. <laughs> so black and white. Um, the, the Bursts of color you alluded to in the middle of the film, and like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and things like that. Really, I, I felt like this film was also a love letter to cinema. Like I was imagining this was 
this piece, I assume, is autobiographical. The, the, you yeah. saw those films as a child growing up in Belfast. Yeah, we had. Now, hey, Jude, had you, had you ever seen Chitty Chitty Bang Bang before we showed it to you on the set? Um, I've seen clips of it, but not like, um, like I've seen clips of it before, but I haven't watched the full film, though. <laughs> Jane, you can show you seen because one of one of the pleasures I had on when we were shooting that was trying to I tried to withhold the pieces from you as as, as much as possible. Have you seen either of those films or uh Chitty Chitty Bang Bang or a million years BC? Definitely Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, but I haven't not feeling Yeah, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, big favorite of mine. I was uh haven't seen a million years BC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean I should though. Oops. <laughs> um, so, with the decision to shoot, you, so we, obviously we were filming this during the pandemic and operating under pandemic conditions. So, um, before we came out, you were telling me that, that that was a constructed set. The, the street that they lived on was completely built. Um, so, can, can you talk a bit about just uh, whatever you care to share about the challenges of shooting under COVID, were there things that you enjoyed about it that were enhanced the experience for you, or was it just, you had to just deal with like practical limitations for health and safety? Uh, I, I think, you know, uh, free, freedom means having no choice. So we had no choice and uh, there was a freedom to do with uh, the building up of some family feeling that was, you know, partly because these guys were all in a bubble. Um, and then it was a certain kind of, uh, quiet ritual, um, you know, the props folk would go in first and then they'd come out of the set and then the electrics would go in and then they'd come out and then the actors would arrive, there'd be very few people. Um, and although it was true of Belfast, whenever the sun did shine, we did open the windows and, you know, let the air in. All of the windows in, in, that are open in this film are partly to do with airflow and COVID regulations. So, so anytime we, anytime we could get the windows open, we did. The weather satisfied us in that regard as well. But everybody had to test every day. Everybody tested for two weeks before they came in. Um, and uh, I think, well, how did it feel to you? Was there something about the the routine of that that was scary? I know it was a, sort of with my producer hat on. It's pretty sweaty every morning when the test came in. How did, <laughs> How was, it, how was it for you guys, the COVID at all? I mean, it's, it's one of those things, you you know, I think very quickly it becomes just routine. But I do think there is, again, that kind of bonding thing that happens because of it. So, you know, even with all of our crew who were absolutely amazing, um, you know, because it was such a small group of us, I think we all got to know each other very well. And I think it, it adds, I don't know, there was that kind of, we were the only, I think it was us and Batman, right? We're the only two films up, so it was sort of a, a pioneering quality to it too. Yeah, and, and sort of a gratitude, sense of gratitude and privilege and sort of the preciousness of being able to do it. I did think, uh, we, we had, if you recall, we gave, we gave first jobs to about 10 drama students who had their first, had their first professional work on this and they'd been you know, they had no, you know, they had no necessarily prospect of, of doing anything. So that energy coming onto the set was also a, a, amazing, as a, as as was, you know, eighty-five-year-old Judy Dentures, who was, was thrilled to be back and working and and, uh, and bringing that kind of uh, energy. Her, her late husband Michael Williams used to say that the problem with Judy is every day is Christmas bloody morning. <laughs> 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 Katrina, um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about your role. I, I, I mean, the, the whole family dynamic is so powerful and everybody's connected, but you know, like you were the beating heart of this family and you know, coming to that painful to see the scene when you finally decide it's time to go was, was so powerful. Um, anything you'd care to share about sort of how you approach that moment and well, the thing about Ma, which I love so much, is that in her little street, in her little community, she is so confident in herself and knows who she is, but anything beyond that is, is totally beyond her comprehension when she becomes a little child, even thinking about it. And, you know, it was that thing of being the 
you know, she wanted to protect her children, but for her, the only way she knew how was in this street where she knew. And it took her so long to sort of get to the point where she realized that, you know, she had to step outside of herself for the, for the good of her kids. Um, you know, I, I, in preparation for this role, I, I watched so many interviews of women from Belfast and women from the North who talked about, you know, how they were holding families together during this time or struggling against that. And, you know, as, as an Irish woman, it was so emotional watching all of these stories. Like they, I mean, we, we represent men very well in this film and, and show the beautiful side of their softness, but for a lot of women in the North, they were really, they, they had to sort of hold down the fort when these horrible things were going on around them and, and they carried the weight of what was going on, I think, you know, more, and especially in terms of the families. And so I just, yeah, I, I just wanted to show that and to sort of honor those women and, um, yeah. Another scene where the, what you were just talking about really comes through is when you march Buddy back to the grocery store to return the detergent. <laughs> like that was, you're taking it through like kind of a terrifying situation that he's gonna return that damn soap. That was such a great scene yeah. to film. It was so good. I mean, we, <laughs> this one was buzzing for days after it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I definitely, we had uh, the screening on Thursday and, and my mom was in the audience and, and I kind of said, you know, there's a lot of my mom in that performance and then I felt really bad. <laughs> and I was, uh, you know, I think there's a ferocity to Irish Irish mummies. Um, you know, they, they love you fiercely, but they will, they will give you a clip of the ear if you step out of line. So um, it's great. I mean, you know, that it's just that, that passion and that love, and it's like, it, it, it's with fear as well, you know, you, you don't want anything to happen to them, so it's that tough love that comes through. JB, I wanted to ask you about one moment in the film when you're talking to Buddy, um, it's late in the film where you basically, he's, you know, realizing he's gonna be away from the girl that he's interested in, and you say, and then and he, he references that she's Catholic, and you say, well, there's no issue as, as long as people are kind and, good and decent, that it doesn't matter what tribe you come from. And I, I felt like that really was the point of view of the film, and, and also of you and that. I mean, it was a beautiful moment between you and, and Jude. Um, I'm not sure if the question is for you or for Kenneth, but the, that sentiment um, uh, feels like it drives the film, and it's, it's, a, it's a very hopeful sort of... I mean, I think there's definitely something in that what you said there about being... Uh, one of the messages that's within the film, um, if you can get people thinking along those lines more in that part of the world, it'd be a very good thing, but I think that applies to any division in any part of the world, you know, if you can um, find acceptance and respect uh, for the other side, or what are deemed to be the other side, then that's the only way you're gonna solve any of these problems. Um, so uh, it was, Lovely to be able to play that scene. Um, I very fortunately was brought up that way where it wasn't an us and them in, in, in my household or, or in, in any of my way of thinking in the community I grew up in. So to be able to impart that to uh, my then son <laughs> in, in the movie was, was important to me and I think it's important that that message is in, in the film. Yeah. Um, is it, I at that moment, I, the film feels, you know, it's 1969 Belfast, but it felt very contemporary to me. To, it's, it feels like it, the film speaks to the moment that we're in right now, both in terms of the sense of lockdown, but also that, uh, you know, we are factionalized and we are in different tribes. And they, there's a, you know, I don't know if that was animating your desire to make this film at this time. Were you, were you thinking about that at all? As, as you know, the moment that we're living in right now, politically or culturally? I think, uh, I think probably inevitably, I think what it, it, it's uh, when um, Billy Clanton says, uh, you know, I'll keep it simple, you're either with us or you're against us. Uh, that's a, I think that's a, that's a, I understand where it comes from, but it's not, it's not a civilized way to run a society. I don't think you have to, there's so many 
different, there's so many layers and gray areas between strong positions held by people who may oppose each other. And uh, although it is very difficult, it is very difficult, there's no question about that. The necessity for understanding has never been greater. And of course, the understanding is hard work. You know, you have to, you have to sort of not be entrenched and, you know, you have to accept that a passionate point of view need not be undermined by listening to another passionate point of view and, and considering, in fact, your passionate point of view might be enriched by that. It's all easy to say, it's hard to do, um, and so uh, inevitably, you, you were talking about this as well, weren't you? Just the, the, just the, the, the other night, the, the yeah, the, the, the tribalism, our, our version of tribalism. Yeah, we, we, I mean, the peace process in the Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland happened in 97, I think, was the Good Friday Agreement. Um, uh, it was a long, long time coming. And uh, you know, we, we would all, I guess, be supportive of integrated education in the Northern Ireland. So because there was a system whereby uh, church and state at the ages of four, kids go to different schools. And it was something that's very important to us that integrated education become a major force in the healing of what's happened in the province of Northern Ireland. And uh, it just makes complete sense because people, as we know, aren't born with racism or hatred or sectarianism and it's informed. And the idea is once you leave it to yourself and they share ideas, they can make them they make their own mind up and it won't be as divisive as the culture that we have come from. And now we're 20, four years on down the line, and there's still a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of work to do, and we recognize that, and there are a lot of good people at home, a lot of good people still working to heal the divisions and go out into the different communities and get them together. But uh, this rift runs deep, and uh, so the only hope is that we can keep pushing forward with positive agendas and keep trying to connect with each other. Music in the film. It's, it's Van Morrison start to finish and both over song. Can you talk about the experience of working with him on the film? It's, I mean, it's a fantastic score. And, uh, well, thank you. I mean, he's a great artist. Um, he, uh, when I was uh, the age that Jude is in the film, uh, he, he just he spent it seemed to, to like two years almost in, in the, right at the top of the charts with a. a, a Revolutionary album in Astral Weeks, so he was a big, he's a big hero to us. Um, I approached him about this uh, nervously, um, did a sort of a telephonic audition uh, with him, in which the apparently famously grumpy uh, fan uh, sort of ran, ran his eye over me or his ear over me, but he was not remotely grumpy. He was very, he was very engaged with the story about. Uh, you know, leaving Ireland and being away, it seems, seems as though that spoke to him. Um, but of course he has the soul of Belfast in him, you know, and he has this uh, orchestra of a voice, uh, and deep, deep, deep musicality, incredible gift for melody and atmosphere and mood and depth, and, and depth brought to the popular song, if you like. So when he, when he sings Carrick Fergus, accompanied by the chieftains of just a harp and his voice, uh, as, as the father says, cheerio to the to the boy. It's a it's a he he, he brings a level of depth and, and soul to that that is uh, transformative and transcendent. So he was um, a major addition. He wrote all of the mood music, the saxophone music. Um, uh, in response to the script, he came to cuts of the film and he offered suggestions for um, sort of arrangement changes that were sensitive to the film and uh, generally was a. Uh, an, an immense ally, and we were very thrilled to see him there. We, we played the film on Thursday of last week in Belfast, first night at the Belfast Film Festival. It was a hell of a night for us. Um, and he was there, and we were all there, and, and uh, the music uh, and, uh, it really sang. Beautiful. I'm getting the signal. I think the time has come. Thank you all so much for being here. And um, I do have one last question for Jude. Uh, <laughs> having wrapped the film, what do you think? Are you going to keep going with this? <laughs> <laughs>